British officers don't duck. Yes, well, that's what I'm going to be talking about in this video, which is sponsored by, yes, I know, I've got another sponsor. It's extraordinary, isn't it? But true, yes, uh, this is sponsored by audible.com. More of that later. Now, uh, there is a tradition in the British Army, uh, a proud one, I think, uh, that the officers suffer higher casualty rates than the men. Um, and uh, you know, part of the reason that you might be proud of this as an officer corps is that it shows that you're, you're leading from the front and you, you're not putting yourself above the men. Um, and a lot of people who, for instance, buy into this lions led by donkeys argument, which is commonly said about uh, the British in World War I, uh, might be interested to learn that 60 British generals died in action in World War I. Yes, 60 British generals who were supposedly five miles behind the front, you know, swilling champagne in French chateaus. Uh, no, no, they actually died with their men in action. That wouldn't have happened if they'd not been putting themselves in harm's way. Um, and British officers went over the top in World War One, wearing officers' uniform with officers' caps and often carrying you know, swagger sticks and riding crops and so forth that made them mark them out as officers, mark them out as targets for the enemy. Now, of course, if you go back to the medieval period, um, I'm sure that pretty much all knights of all nations like to put their heraldry where everyone could, could see it and could you know, show to the, to the eyes of both armies how much danger they were putting themselves in, how brave and, and wonderful they were being. And I've no reason to believe that British knights on this score behaved any differently from anyone else. Um, uh, and I don't know quite how far back this tradition in the British army goes, uh, but it does seem to go back at least as far as the Napoleonic Wars. Um, and one of the pieces of evidence I have um, is that they kept issuing orders for uh, officers could to please desist from holding meetings within clear sight of and range of the enemy. Well, if orders like that were being issued, then presumably it was a problem. This was something that was actually happening. Um, but I, I say a, a problem. There are, of course, lots of good reasons you might want your officers to stroll around heads high under fire. Um, now, uh, when uh, Winston Churchill went over the top, as he did a few times in World War I. Um, he is supposed to have said, um, um, it's no use ducking. The bullets have already passed you. Actually, he probably didn't say it quite like that because he, was already, he wasn't that old at that stage. It was uh, 1915 or so. Uh, also in 1915, uh, the fifth Earl of Longford, uh, who was a Brigadier General in command at Gallipoli, uh, he is quoted, uh, he supposedly, he said this particularly famous quote on the topic, and don't bother ducking, the men don't like it and it doesn't do any good. Admittedly, his body was never found. We don't know that he was shot shortly after saying that. Some versions of the anecdote have that, but I think they're just sort of taking a, an ironic opportunity there. He is supposed to have said that and he died during the battle. Um, but why would he say that? It doesn't do any good and the men don't like it. Well, does it do any good? Well, if you are actually in the open, there's no cover around, whether you're standing like this or this, doesn't really make a huge amount of difference between your likelihood of being shot and not being shot. Obviously, if, there, if there's a wall that's this height, then ducking behind it could make a big difference. But if you're standing in the open, then walking forwards like this against someone who's deliberately aiming at you with an accurate rifle, it's not really going to make a huge amount of difference. Um, the men don't like it. Well, why wouldn't they like it? Well, imagine if uh, you're going forwards and you can see that your uh, officer is, is cringing and flinching and all the other officers down the line of the other units, they're, they're all head up, bold and upright, you might think possibly that your officer isn't, you know, perhaps made of the, the, the good stuff and that, you know, oh no, I'm in the unit with this guy and it will harm your morale. The men don't like it. They want to perhaps see that you are unafraid and you can lead by example and lead from the front. And even if you do get shot, um, you've shown that you were brave and you you got shot and you, you shared the risk with your men and, and some perhaps men want, might want to avenge you. There are a number of, of times I, I've read of an officer's being killed and the, the men under that officer getting absolutely furious because they love that officer and storming forwards and defeating the enemy as a result of that officer's death. So even the officer being shot, if he was walking boldly before, it does actually have some military purpose, perhaps. Uh, but. Whose word should we take uh, for it? I mean, for instance, uh, Lord Raglan, the legendary figure. Now, he, when he was com uh, commanding uh, to the Battle of Alma, which is the first really big battle of the Crimean War, he pretty much excelled himself when it came to nonchalance under fire uh, because he saw a, a handy uh, prominence and he took himself and his staff up there to uh, watch the battle from there. And he watched the British attack through his field glasses, sitting on his horse, coming towards him. Yes, that's right, coming towards him. 
because he'd picked a spot that was behind enemy lines, within a hundred yards of the nearest Russians. Uh, he got away with it. Um, and uh, in fact, he did serve some military purpose because he, he suggested it was a good place to put some cannon uh, because there were some Russian guns down there. And taking it as a, an order, someone went off and brought up some cannon and yep, they saw off the Russian guns. Um, uh, but um, maybe we shouldn't put too much faith in tales of people like Lord Raglan because they're semi-legendary figures, very, very high commanders, and loads of people would perhaps have a vested interest in, in making him seem more brave than possibly he was. So whom should we trust? Well, the more modern the author, you might say, uh, World War I and World War II, those accounts are perhaps more reliable than ones further back in time. But perhaps we should, we should uh, believe someone who's writing not as an officer, or, and not as about someone else he knew, but as an ordinary trooper just talking about a commander he saw. So if you look at a war memoir from World War II, for instance, war, written by an ordinary trooper describing this sort of behaviour, that would be quite convincing evidence. And we have that. Uh, for instance, um, there's this wonderful book uh, by John Foley, Mailed Fist, which I referred to before. And uh, he has a, a couple of anecdotes. And I'm just going to read this uh, quote here. Uh, so they're in, at this point, they're in the middle of a battle. We pulled into the buildings with them and I looked around for the company commander. He was walking along a bit of a road, quietly smoking his pipe. With his little cane and his red hackle on the side of his cap, he might well have been out for a Sunday morning stroll down Aldershot High Street, uh, except that vicious little spurts of dust were cracking about his heels. He raised his stick in greeting uh, when he saw five troop and, uh, completely indifferent to the bullets kicking up the dirt around him, he strolled across to Avenger and swung up to the turret. Going very well so far, he said pleasantly. How's your funny boys getting on with the breaching that minefield? They're all bogged, I said gloomily. Uh, l look here, <clears throat> aren't you being shot at? Oh, never mind that, he said. It's just got nuisance value. Well, it's a pity you can't get across that minefield. It looks like we'll have to go on without you. Balls, I said, and hastily added, sir, because he was, after all, a major, even though it looked to me as though he would soon be a dead one. Well, um, that's what he said at that point. And uh, at another point, he's talking about uh, his operations when they were trying to take Le Havre off the Germans. And uh, things had gone very well, and they'd rolled forward and destroyed lots of machine gun nests and taken out lots of anti-tank guns and so forth. And uh, he opened his turret and popped out and uh, saw an infantry commander strolling along nonchalantly, pretty much in that same sort of way, over towards him. And uh, they discussed how things had gone very well, and the infantry commander said, yeah, there's only one thing I'm uh, still a bit worried about. There's see that um, stone house, house over there. At that moment, an, a shot rings out from that house, and our man, uh, John Foley, collapses down into the turret, his face covered in blood. His, his crew is, is, is almost panic-stricken. My goodness, where are you hit, sir? Where are you hit? I don't know. I don't know. You, you, you can see. Where am I hit? I don't know. I can't see a wound. They're wiping away the blood and they can't find a wound. And he realises, oh, I don't seem to be in all that much pain. And no, oh, it seems to have stopped bleeding, even though his face was completely covered in blood. Um, anyway, he, where did this come from, sir? He, one of the crewmen said, and he weakly pointed in the direction of the stone house, and they swung the turret round and started using the Beezer machine gun to brass up this stone house. Da, 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 da. Anyway, after a while, he crawls back up out of the turret, and there, still, is the company commander, who'd just been standing bolt upright, waiting next to him, <laughs> next to the tank for him, and he says, um, all right, yeah, well, I see what happened here, and he indicates that the hatch uh, that was in front of uh, John Foley's head uh, has a little shiny patch on the edge of it. The bullet had missed his head by a few inches and had hit the edge of the hatch and had shattered into a thousand little pieces that he found next time he, he shaved. There's loads of little bits of lead and these had, had caused a great sheet of blood to appear but no deep uh, disabling wound. Anyway, uh, so the, uh, the, the, the man saying, um, yeah, yeah, funny thing, snipers. He had all of me to aim at but uh, Still took a pop at your head. Anyway, yes, that's the stone house I meant. Uh, <laughs> and um, this, this behaviour I have read in so many, uh, so, so many uh, war memoirs. Uh, this is Ken Toot's Utterly Superb Tank, in which he says, um, as they bumble through their jokes and just stay awake, more mortar bombs bracket the tank, keeping me more than awake. Get down inside the tank. 
cosy safety of thick steel walls. My eyes are heavy when I need to be able to pierce every leafy bush and hedgerow to spot tanks, men, guns. I am weary to the point of despair. And then I see Major Bevan taking an afternoon stroll. Am I, am I seeing things? Have I gone round the bend? Hank, out for a stroll? In a thunderstorm of battle, whose rain is jagged iron splinters, whose lightning strikes again and again at the same places, whose thunder continues peal overlaid on peal, tall, lean, languid, he ambles along the verge of the vegetable field, swishing his riding, uh, riding crops at uh, tall weeds. He pauses and he waves his riding crop at a thicket about 50 yards away from us. Presumably another of our Shermans is nestled there, invisible to us. For miles around, everyone has gone to ground. German grenadiers, black watch in their foxhold, yeomanry inside their tanks, artillery in their gun pits. But Major Bevan chooses to walk above the earth. He's wearing the normal officer's cap, as opposed to the beret, which, mo which most of us wear. A khaki shirt, a cloth crown on each epaulette, and an old loose pair of corduroys. More minis fall a hundred yards behind him, but he continues his stroll towards us without haste. At the gap in the hedge to our rear, which is our escape route, he pauses again, then changes direction and walks across to Stony Stratford. He looks critically at the burnt camouflage branches still adorning the tank beneath Bookie's green, fresh decorations, flicks away a dead branch with his riding crop. I give him a rather sketchy salute. He touches his cap with his riding crop in a familiar gesture, gives Stony Stratford a friendly wallop across the rump as though she were a horse, screws his face into a combination of a grin and a wink, then continues his ramble back through the hedge. I see his cap beyond thinner patches of hedge as he strolls along the cart track, which is the focus of our world war at this moment. Sporadic explosions continue as he turns and heads back up the slope, still at the same Sunday afternoon pace, pace towards where HQF must presumably be. I no longer contemplate diving for refuge inside the turret. If David Bevan can saunter coolly across the field of fire, well, then I can stand up in my tank and keep a clear watch. So it seems that uh, these ordinary troopers were indeed inspired by the nonchalant bravery of their officers. When uh, Dickie Attenborough was uh, directing uh, the film uh, A Bridge Too Far, which incidentally I would definitely recommend, it's, it's so epic and it stars every top male star of the, of the, of the era. And it's, it's um, one of the things which is so impressive about it is that it's before CGI. So when you see thousands of parachutes in the air coming towards the ground, that's actually because they had thousands of parachutes in the air with men jumping out of Dakotas. And uh, when you see uh, fighter bombers swooping very low to the ground and massive explosions and loads of tanks and loads of troops running everywhere all in one shot, that's because they actually had big explosions and swooping aircraft and all those tanks and all those men all in one shot. It's not CGI. They didn't add the explosions and the swooping aircraft on later. It's all actually there happening in front of you. And uh, this was uh, also shot uh, quite a long time ago when there were still quite a lot of the uniforms and the, and the tanks or at least similar tanks still around. Uh, so there you go. An epic film. And I've somewhat uh, got sidetracked. Oh, yes, I remember. Yes. So there's a character played by Tony Hopkins, uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Frost who was on the bridge at Arnhem. And the actual man himself was one of the historical advisors of the film. And uh, he was absolutely shocked when he saw Tony Hopkins rushing across the street, ducking and, and, and diving and flinching at all the bullets being fired at him. Oh, no, 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 he said to Dickie Attenborough. No, 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 no British officer walks like that. No, 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 British officer, head up, eyes forward, strolls calmly. Uh, it's a good example to the men. Well, Dickie Attenborough, I didn't exactly disbelieve him, but thought that perhaps the audience for the film would disbelieve him and so uh, felt that it was better to have Tony Hopkins just still doing all the ducking and weaving. Um, and uh, yes, anyway, so uh, that, what was that? that Cornelius Ryan wrote the book, uh, Bridge Too Far, yes. It's not a perfect film. Uh, why did they not manage to persuade Robert Redford to have a decent haircut? But uh, there you go, he was a very vain man, it seems. Anyway, um, audible.com.
Com. Now, Audible.com, the sponsor of this video, uh, is a company that uh, has a big website online, which is a big library of audiobooks and all sorts of topics, uh, fiction as well as fact, all sorts of uh, periods covered and, and genres. And um, if you are, I don't know, busy or, or you have an awful commute to work and you want to listen to something other than ghastly local radio, well, you can because that's sort of the point. You can listen wherever you are, if you've got a mobile device or, or on your computer, um, and you can listen to books and a lot of them are completely unabridged. I've been listening uh, to The River War for instance by Winston Churchill. Uh, his account, his classic account of uh, you know uh, the Nile, Gordon, Khartoum, the Mad Mardi, all that business and it's, uh, it's, it's read in this and grasses uh, grow rank rather, and rather coarse from the water's edge, voice. the dark rotten soil between the tussocks. Oh, yeah. See, quality. Um, and uh, so I'm enjoying that. And uh, you, but you there are loads of books of all sorts of topics that you could uh, you could enjoy, and you can get one for free. Yes, you can because if you click on the the link uh, in the description of this, uh, or you you type in www.audio.audible.com stroke Lindy Beige. Yes, I'm British and I say stroke. Um, then uh, uh, you will get one free month's membership and one credit which you can you can cash in if you like you can you can get one book and it's yours to keep forever you don't have to give it back or read it within the one month no no it's yours um and to, to listen to whenever is convenient to you so you can have a a, you know, a a trial if you like well this is a trial so go to audible.com stroke lindy beige and uh, why not listen to a free audio book uh now um maybe i should come right up to date uh for uh now this is uh, a book written in um, well quite recently. It's talking about 2007 Afghanistan. It's uh, Patrick Hennessy's The Junior Officers Reading Club, and I really did like this book. It's it's very very good about the psychology of war, what, what soldiers are thinking and feeling. It's very good on that. I, I found it actually very disappointing and frustrating uh, in that whenever he's describing a, a, a fight with his, his men, his platoon and so forth, he never really tells you exactly what's going on, what orders he gives, you know, the actual tactics, the actual how they went about the, the fighting bit. But on the psychology of war, it's very, very good. Anyway, um, I was very amused by this anecdote. Uh, there in a very dangerous position, they're on top of a house, there are Taliban all around shooting them from, uh, from all directions for day after day, and he's with this guy called Sherlock. Um, now I had it, was in the middle of it, and I could see, and all I could see was Sherlock standing over me as time slowed with the deafening surprise of his latest burst in a picture of Brecon Nightmare, no helmet, no body armour, standing upright on the roof, silhouetted against the lum, illumination, still popping up with his rifle jammed into his hip with one hand, loosing huge bursts of automatic whilst lighting a fag with the other fag, British uh, slang for cigarette. Fucking hell, Sherlock! Even as I'd interjected it as much for the deafening as the wanton affront to all that the British Army held dear, and he'd looked down at me apologetically and dropped to the floor as if just realising his slackness, and then fished out another fag. Oh, sorry, sir. I should have offered. <laughs>